Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn from Focus Compounding, sitting next to Jeff Cannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you are tuning in with us, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out all of our content that we put out on the internet. Go to focuscompounding.com to get access to investment write-ups by Jeff. Uh, follow me on Twitter at, at Focus Compound. And if you're interested in learning more about our money management services, uh, we do have a hedge fund and we do have a separate managed accounts arm. Uh, you could get more information on that by going to our Invest With Us tab at focuscompounding.com, or you can reach out to me at andrew at focuscompounding.com. So in today's podcast, we are going to eventually talk about roll-up companies. Um, that was a request by people that listen to the podcast. And before we jump into that, we could just hit on the markets really quickly. The SP 500 is down about 12.21%, 10-year yield 2.868%. Um, uh, markets rallied since our last podcast. The 10-year, I believe, has basically been um, in the same pocket or has it really moved around as much? Crude oil has been breaking out, um, $119 a barrel, and natural gas is $8.52. Um, that's where we are from this uh, as we record that here today. One of the big news that came out, which is probably driving the price of oil, is oil prices. Um, they jumped after the EU leaders uh, agreed to ban most of Russian crude imports that came out late last night. So there's still a huge supply demand imbalance in the crude market. Again, it's still hard to believe that at one point in 2020, crude oil was selling for negative $30 a barrel and change, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Did you ever read of some stories that people that bought oil at like $0 because they're like, well, it can't go below, like they bought like the oil futures okay. at $0 because they're like, well, it can't go below zero. So this has to be like the biggest asymmetric trade of my life only to learn that I guess futures can go negative and it was a huge issue for them. I remember reading about like interactive brokers and TD Ameritrade and how those companies were managing their own risk that came out of negative oil. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's been interesting. Um, uh, did you see the new Top Gun? I did not see it, no. You did not I watch not it. it yet. So we've always talked about like this with Will movie theaters be back if the product is there? Um, Top Gun, it set a record close to it, 151 million. It's on a their more first, record, yeah. uh, first week. I think they said the last record was like in 2007 or something close to it. I forget, was it Star Wars or something? Or Pirates of the Caribbean? Pirates of the Caribbean, yeah. Uh -huh. one of those, yeah. Uh, yeah, it should be a record for Memorial Day weekend. It should also be a record for a domestic Tom Cruise. Yeah, yeah. 151 million. Have you looked at movie theater companies recently? I know we obviously talk about movie theaters often on the podcast. Prices haven't moved a lot on several of them. We don't look at AMC, so I, I'm sure that one moves on. It's Is that even a movie theater company um, anymore? They're a gold miner company. Yeah. Uh, but mo like Marcus and Cinemark are fairly similar. Um, prices where they were before, right? Around 15, 17, yep. 13. They've been in that range for, you know. Um, we could see year to date what it looks like. But, yeah, we're right where we were at the start of the year. Yeah. Do you think movie theaters, I mean, how would you think about it if you're looking to I think, potentially invest in movie theaters? I think Cinemark's cheap. It's not incredibly cheap, but if you look at Quick FS, you can see that the top sales number that they hit was 3.3 billion, basically. Mm -hmm. And EV, even including leases and stuff, is 3.9. Uh, the 10 year average, you know, the median EBIT that they have there. And this is why you use median because that helps it, it gets rid of the uh, 2020. You know, if you ask why do you use median, usually it doesn't matter that much. But when you have years like that, it does um, is 14.5 percent. So um, another way to look at it is pre-tax income, because okay. obviously that takes care of the the interest and all that. Um, and that also is about 10 percent. Uh, free cash is a lot lower, uh, but you've got a, numbers that say that it's pretty cheap. Um, doesn't look as cheap if you look at more recent years. The other way of doing it, which is very easy for uh, Cinemark, is basically it hasn't made much less than 400 million in operating income. 
so EBIT, mm-hmm. in almost any years. And in fact, if you adjust for inflation, obviously it would be over 400 in all of those. So before the pandemic, the last time it had made less than 400 million was back in what, 2014? Is that right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it made slightly less. Million. And in 2012, it made a little less too. 399 million. Yeah. So still about 400 million. And obviously there's been a ton of inflation in the eight years since then. Um, so inflation adjusted way over 400 million would be expected if uh, movie theaters got back to where they were before. Mm. So obviously you don't have that now, but if you did, then you'd be making over 400 million in pre-tax income. Uh, obviously there also have been a tax cut since those low numbers happened. So that converts into even more mm-hmm. after tax income. Another way of looking at it is you could look at the earnings per share. Um, some of these companies have diluted though. That's particularly noticeable with um, Marcus has a convertible out. But um, you can see with the earnings per share that you're talking about a stock that's at $17 and there's not many years, there's a few, but not many where it earned less than $1.70. So basically it's not trading for more than 10 times. I'd say by almost any reasonable measure, it's trading at less than 10 times earnings. Mm -hmm. So that you just laid out like a great thesis, right? And a question that we actually had that somebody tweeted was how do you know when you have enough information to make an investment? Know that it's impossible to know, knowing that it's impossible to know everything. Also, do you think about selling something cheap to buy something else that offers a better risk reward? But we could hit the first part of that question. So you just laid out how you think, you know, it's basically at 10 times earnings if you average out what it's done since 2012 and Mm -hmm. you kind of adjust for the blips in the, uh, you know, the timeline of over the past, you know, since 2012. So how would you think? about like, okay, I have enough confidence to be able to buy or invest in Cinemark. I mean, what would you need to see? I don't think I need anything more. Uh, This is a multi-billion dollar, not many billions, but a few billion dollar company. So it's in the same class as what we talked about, Stella Jones and DaVita and things like that. If I was running a fund that was looking for things in that size, I would also own Cinemark. Um, however, there's not enough information to know that the stock will perform well in the next, or the company will perform well in the next like year or two, because there's too much change going on in the economy. So for instance, there'll be supply chain issues where they won't have sufficient concessions. So that'll be an issue. They may not raise prices fast enough because they're trying to get everyone back to the movies and all that. They may be slow to do that, although they'll eventually do it. And so they may lag inflation on that. And then also they're going to have labor problems because you got rid of a lot of people and then it's hard to bring them back. Uh, And the kind of labor that they employ at their locations will make it more difficult to do that at a reasonable price. So you could have margin contraction and all sorts of strange things happening um, for the next year or two or something like that. Um, With inflation this high, it's kind of a problem as they're recently reopened and all that. Um, But there's no reason why those things wouldn't uh, be fixed few years down the road and they'll be fixed no matter what either way i mean if they don't get them under control soon they'll raise prices by a lot um and what's one or two years in a 10-year dcf even though you don't right. do a dcf and, uh, but i mean if you're thinking about what it could be earning five to ten years from now right and i don't see cinemark as having credit risk issues now a little more complicated with marcus and redding so these are two other small uh, smaller um movie theater chains and uh i think the ones the easiest way to own movie theaters in the us would be and best price and stuff would be owning cinemark it's like a pure play it's a pure play it leverages the most to that all those sorts of things marcus it's more debatable whether it's cheap or not it is controlled it's a controlled company um as is reading um marcus i would say is potentially very cheap if you take into account land and the value of the hotels, but obviously some things have changed with hotels. You're getting exposure to something that's a different kind of um, industry that way, and they may have to sell things or whatever. I mean, not that their balance sheet is particularly uh, a difficult situation at all, but it's much easier to understand it with Cinemark. But, um, so some of the parts, I think that uh, Marcus is cheap, but it's also worth noting that both of these companies now ha- are, uh, their stocks have not performed well over a very long period of time. So because of COVID and sometimes some other things too, um, if we look at the entire period, you're looking at uh, companies that are back at prices that they were at a very long time ago. Mm-hmm. So, And you compare that to the S&P 500. Right. And the well, S&P 500 has destroyed Marcus and Cinemark. Right. So I think Marcus and Cinemark literally 
are at prices that they were at in the early 2000s. In fact, Marcus might be at prices it was at in the 90s. Cinemark's history doesn't go back that far as a public company, I don't think. Um, but it, certainly we're looking at this, it goes back almost 20 years, so 15, 20 years. They're at the same price that they were at back then. Much lower valuation, and I think that they're a lot cheaper um, versus the S&P than they were back then, obviously. Also, sometimes you're getting large dividends. So Cinemark, you're getting large dividends. If you look at what they're paying before, this is the other way to think about it, is what dividends were they paying before and were they capable of paying it? They paid 64 cents a share. So um, they were certainly pretty capable of that. They were paying 64 cents a share at the time they were earning $1.35, something like that. Yeah. They're, you know, so they're paying between a third and half of their earnings out. And their earnings are about probably, they'd be quite capable of earning more than 10% on their, their market price now. Um, that's a shorthand way to see if a business is, could potentially be a great business. If you look at their EPS and then how much they pay out in dividends per share, if they're able to pay out a third to more, well, obviously that's a sign of a pretty decent business. Right. So like right now, if they got back to paying the dividend, they were before Marcus, they'd also have a 4% dividend yield. So you have a 4% dividend yield in addition to potential for, you know, market uh, for multiple expansion and you have these hotels and some excess land that you could get rid of. So um, Cinemark, I think still though, if you look at their quick FS, they're, they are more of a pure play um, and more of a um, earnings uh, that they're cheap on an earnings basis. So their dividends they were paying out, they were up to $1.36 a share. And they've been raising it all the time. Um, they're paying out a lot of their earnings, a very large percentage and uh, whether it was 75, 80%, they had a high payout ratio. So they could be capable of paying that out again. And obviously in that case, depending on what price you're paying, you could be talking about an 8% dividend yield or something like that if they got back to that in the future. They won't instantly do it. But over a long holding period, you probably get a lot of your returns back in dividends unless they decide to do buybacks or something like that. But um, the way their, their capital allocation has worked in the past, that would definitely be the case. And these aren't meaningless in terms of the history of the company. Like from 2014 to 2019, let's see. Yeah, they would have paid out, what is that, close to $7 a share? Mm -hmm. And the stock now is at 17 So, you know, that's a very big reason for why it's at 17 and not at a different price is because you were collecting a lot of dividends and presumably you will collect those again in the future. How are you thinking about the slate and the product that's going to be coming on the market? I mean, would you be looking at the movies that are set to premiere and to try to get an idea of, well, I mean, we just saw it with Top Gun, right? There was a good product and there's demand for good product. How would you be thinking about that side of the business? Because yeah. without good product, movie theaters are in trouble. Yeah, product's very strong uh, for the next two years, for 2020, for the next two calendar years, for 2022, um, 2023, it's very strong. It's been spread out a little bit more, which we talked about last year that they needed to do that. So, for instance, Tom Cruise had three movies really scheduled too close to each other. Three huge movies. Um, Top Gun, Maverick, and um, the two Mission Impossibles, um, which were filmed back to back. So, uh, they had to space those out more. They ended up moving all those movies in terms of their release dates. They were all planned for earlier. This movie, Top Gun, was planned for earlier. And so were the um, Mission Impossible movies, which I think they're going to do as part one, part two kind of thing. Um, so that's my mission muscle seven and eight. Uh, so, you know, and it's still very strong, but it, they are spacing out a little bit better than they were before. Um, also this matters a lot. Movies like this, like how well they do matter a lot, probably for the company that releases them. This is a Paramount movie as are the mission possible, um, movie, same thing or Tom Cruise. And so, um, this could be important for them because this will go to Paramount plus presumably. Um, cause I think it's a, uh, Paramount Skydance production, probably. I think that's right. Um, so presumably they have the rights to it to put on Paramount Plus as soon as they want when it comes out of theaters. Um, and that can help Paramount Plus, obviously, and it can help Paramount. An individual movie being released doesn't have a huge impact on, um, most movie studios. The Paramount is more, um, their, relative to their entire movie, um, arm. It's pretty big. It's very big, but the public company has lots of stuff besides just the movie studio. So I think that 
the slate isn't really that important in evaluating whether you're going to buy the stock or not. That's a timing thing. If you're saying, mm -hmm. oh, it'll be strong in the next couple of years or not, I don't think that that matters as much. Um, you can see that in the past results for the company, like Cinemark or whatever. This doesn't look that, you know, it's not like they're great years and bad years. It's pretty consistent in terms of what you see there. And a lot of the inconsistency happens with margin stuff, some of which is actually expense things and not um, revenue. Do you think the 66% gross margin is a normalized margin going forward? Could it be, okay, they come out of this and the gross margins are actually better than they have historically been? I don't know. Um, and I, you wouldn't value it on it. You would just take an average of it. So I think some theaters are going to um, use fewer hours, and that will mean more hours during which there's large food and beverage. So I expect that the average food and beverage spend related to each ticket will be higher. I don't know that that means that you have a lot more food and beverage um, in absolute terms, but that skews the margins because food and beverage and tickets have different margins. So I think that you that's the biggest thing that I see is that they'll I expect fewer hours and more hours during which people are um, eating and drinking. Uh, I also expect more money made in previews and in the first weekend. When we've seen that, uh, for instance, if you look at this movie, what did we say that it did? One hundred fifty million. Yep. If you had used just preview numbers, you would have expected it to do over 200 million probably. That okay. is, if you use nothing else in your model, you just take the previews. So what are, does that mean? It's the first night that it comes out. So you take that and assume a multiplier on it. So you use that as like a data point um, to come up with an estimate of what you think the movie will do. So if you took the first night that this movie came out and you just said how much did it make compared to other movies historically that make that much in that night and multiply it through this make over 200 million. Um, that is, did not happen. Uh, this is a big number, but it's actually far short of what would happen based on the previews. And we've seen that again and again with movies recently. James Bond was a good example. Some people, that was the first one I remember where people were very disappointed where they said, oh, it's going to make like a hundred million. Right. And it made like, um, you know, 40% less than that in the opening weekend. But it, models that incorporate other things besides previews and give them more weight would never have expected that high a number. That's being done by things that are using models that give very high uh, numbers for previews. And what we've seen since COVID happened with reopening is that they're making much more money early on with the previews in the first weekend. We've also seen that in terms of drops. You had huge drops, uh, abnormally large drops, kind of. Um, somewhat closer to normal drop, but still large for Doctor Strange. And then a very large drop for um, Downton Abbey. The Down Abbey drop was huge for something in that uh, demographic. Because, see, it's normal to have for, like, a superhero movie a drop like Doctor Strange. Although the Doctor Strange drop was almost in line with, like, a horror movie drop more than a superhero drop. So, again, that means, like, front-loading. Doctor Strange is still going to make a lot of money. It'll make the kind of money it would be expected to make. It's just that more of it gets made in the first weekend. And we'll see next weekend if that holds true with Top Gun. The... Um, I think they'll be more front loaded and the window will be shorter. And I don't think the window being shorter is much of a problem for the total run of the movie. I don't think it really matters. Um, that does cause some interesting things for theaters. I'm not sure that you need as many screens if you're pulling movies faster because you want some amount of diversity that way, but there'll be fewer movies out at the same time. So uh, you might be able to do with less screens. Do you think, Opening weekend would have been as successful if it wasn't a three-day weekend over Memorial Day for Top Gun? Uh, no, I don't think so. Although uh, we actually have data on that. And it was very strong. So they, they count both the two-day and the three-day mm. and they have it separately. So it was very strong. In fact, it was very front-loaded. Uh, but if you mean that the holiday weekend causes more people to go because yeah. they know they're not working, yes. Mm -hmm. That's why they pick Memorial Day to release certain movies. So you still like Cinemark? We've talked about in the past how in some entertainment companies you would be potentially interested in building like a leap position as a way that you could structure it. Is that mm -hmm. something that you still would think about or look to do? I don't think it's necessary with the theater companies. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, I think they're, uh, it depends, not all of them. I think Cinemark's pretty safe um, in terms of what happened with credit things over time. So I don't think that that's necessarily a, an issue. And leaps, if you're not hedging, you have a problem that if the market declines, your your leap is in a lot of danger, even if the stock does well. So you have to figure out a way to hedge to buy leaps. What about cruise lines? Because I read this past week in an article that 
a lot of cruises are having a huge labor shortage as well. Mm-hmm. So there's been cancellations. They've closed off restaurants and parts of the cruises. They're working with more staff or less staff. So I guess the staff is being a little bit more overworked. I mean, do you have any thoughts on cruises? Yeah, I mean, I think that movie theaters are better business than cruises. Um, I think that they're facing the same issues, though. I think Cinemark will face some of the same issues, too. I think that there will have shortages in terms of um, concessions and I think labor issues. And I think concession lines will be longer than they should be. And uh, customer satisfaction will decline and things like that. And I expect the same thing with cruises, but certainly I expect that with movie theaters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So on that first question, though, how do you know when you have enough information to make an investment, knowing that it's basically impossible to know everything? Um, well, it depends on what, why you're buying it. So what justifies the purchase? In the case of something like Cinemark, what we're saying is um, you're getting, if it was in a normal state right now, the, if it was on trend, sort of the, um, the movie business, um, your, the purchase price that you're paying right now is getting you a double digit yield. Um, so I would say that that is usually going to be sufficient. If the business grows even at the rate of inflation or something, that'll get you a good enough return. So we did kind of a more cautious estimate and still got 10%. Because it's not on trend, that's just getting back to levels it was before. But presumably, you know, we don't know if they'll ever get exactly back to trend, but there's not a lot of reasons to believe it won't be similar to what it was before. Now, some people may say that there are reasons, and that's something that's difficult because it's hard to know. Um, I don't think there's a lot of justification for saying that it's different than it was before for movie theaters um, in terms of what we expect the box office to be. It may be, however, that it's off trend of like losing those years in essence. Um, and so you only get back to where you were before. Um, but I, you know, it's not, a, it, it basically is that you're betting on a return to what it was before getting you better than 10% returns. If you had a much different price, then you would need to know a lot more about it. So like when I wrote up NACO, um, my point was basically that the stock, although it had durability issues, right? It, it may not have um, coal customers forever. You're getting about a 15% yield as I calculated in terms of like a free cash flow yield or something at the time you're buying it versus about 5% for most other companies, you know? Um, and it was a real yield, right? So it kind of moves out with inflation because that's the way the contracts work and stuff. Um, so that kind of advantage, a uh, thousand basis point advantage, 10 percentage point advantage, um, requires a lot less knowing what the future will be. So if you know what the future will be for the next five years and you know sort of how they'll allocate that, then that might be enough in that case. Um, obviously, there could be things. Cinemark, what if they made a capital allocation like AMC does? Then suddenly it's a different question. Mm -hmm. um, Reading would be a lot more complicated. There's a ton of real estate there. Marcus is a little bit more complicated. There's some real estate and some hotels there. So the one I gave is the simplest one to kind of figure out Cinemark. So um but it's a question we get all the time, and I think it depends on the variability. Um, it depends on how much you're sort of paying for the future um, and how confident you are in sort of some behavior and stuff like that. In the case why we talk about something like movie theaters is I just am very confident in the behavior there as compared to other industries. So when I compare Cinemark to Snapchat or something, th th I don't need as much information about Cinemark because I feel like I understand the behavior, mm -hmm. right? Because the behavior is the behavior of studios, which is the riskiest part of it now with the streaming and everything that that supply is kind of the risky part of it with the window and with whether they'll release more stuff, not in theaters. So that part's hard. But then you have the customer behavior, which I think is a lot more predictable. And then you have um, the fact that it's customers paying you for it as opposed to like advertising supported or something like that in a different industry. Um, and then, you know, with um, – and that's the same reason why we talked about Stella Jones before. We talked about DaVita. DaVita, you'd need to know a lot about, like, government insurance and things like that. But Stella Jones, since it's almost all replacement, um, so it isn't based on uh, anything but maintenance CapEx usually, the very little. That is other than maintenance CapEx and utility poles and railway ties. Because railroads and utilities generally aren't growing in the United States and Canada. So if it's completely replacement supply, that makes it a lot easier to calculate. The part that's harder is like 
part where I was saying where they have a business with decks and things like you, it's harder to break out what's the replacement supply and then what is actual kind of purchasing on top of that that's unusual. It'd be the same with cars or something. It'd be you'd have to kind of adjust for the cyclicality of it. Mm -hmm. How do you think about selling something cheap to buy something else that offers a better risk reward? That's another question we get often. I mean, I think I can't remember if you said it was early 2000s or 2008 where you said you were turning over your portfolio a good amount because some companies that were just so great got so cheap. In the first quarter or so of 2009, first four months of 2009, I turned over the portfolio more than 100 percent. Everything turned over. It's very it. unusual for the way that you invest. Yeah. In four months, it's more turnover than you have in four years. Now, was that selling something that you liked mm -hmm. less to buy something that you liked more or right. did the portfolio since you're more of a value or you are a value investor did the value side take off while these other names got smoked so you turned over the portfolio like that because you had good returns coming yeah. out of the financial crisis so it was selling something that i liked to buy something that it was cheaper that i liked better you know so for instance i sold berkshire hathaway um to buy more ims health i already own some ims health but i wanted to buy more of it so i sold some berkshire and bought some ims health as an example don't know make sure positions and stuff, but did that because I thought it offered much better returns than Berkshire at that point. Um, Berkshire seemed to offer good enough returns at that in early 2009, but other things started to offer much better a few months later. What was IMF? Do you remember like like a multiple it was trading at? About 10 times free cash flow. Yeah, so very cheap. Yeah, and it was buying back. It was using almost all of it to buy back stock at the time. Of course, you didn't know if that would continue with the market crash, but yeah. Mm -hmm. So speaking of Berkshire, somebody asked, we said, here is one that not even fund managers studying Buffett for decades could answer. So it sounds like he's calling you out. Why slash how would regulators allow him to use float in stocks in the early days when most are only allowed bonds? Well, that's easy. Uh, insurance is not regulated at the federal level. It's regulated state by state. Um, Berkshire's insurance companies are domiciled in Nebraska. And so you, if you have an insurance company in Nebraska, you can do the same things that Buffett does. Um, there are different things having to do with, um, uh, you know, what kind of insurance company you are and how you invest things that might be a little different in terms of how state regulators allow you to do things. So if you had wrote at very high, um, multiples of, uh, premiums to statutory surplus, the other thing is that Buffett, uh, wrote at. Um, his companies generally wrote at very low premiums to statutory surplus. So uh, sometimes incredibly low. So if you look, a lot of times they're writing at what some of the safest um, insurers in um, more specialty lines write in, as opposed to like what a progressive or something would be doing. A progressive or a Geico, if they're not part of a larger insurance operation, would probably, it would be hesitant for a regulator to let them take a lot of investment risk. Um, because they're taking a lot of underwriting risk. Um, they're, they're sometimes writing three times more or something uh, in terms of premiums relative to surplus than others are. Um, so, for instance, you know, we mentioned universal insurance in Florida. Uh, they have a huge bond portfolio, but that doesn't make it safer than something that has a very large stock portfolio. Um, Buffett also wasn't all in stocks in the early days. You can read um, Jacob McDonough's book, but they actually were in a fair, uh, the overall company, Berkshire Hathaway, we know, was in a fair amount of um, bonds and things in the early days. And it only became more into stocks in the early part of the 1970s, bought a lot of stocks. And then also it was very much into stocks in the 1980s. Uh, um, and from there, but it already built up a ton of surplus by then. So it was a lot of success in the early years. If they hadn't had a lot of success in the early years, it wouldn't have happened. But uh, I would say that's the reason. There's some states you want to avoid. Like um, for a long time, you know, New York had absurd rules about how to invest. Um, and, you know, I think uh, Ben Graham talks about that a little bit. Um, in uh, one of the security analysis books or something like that, that he bases some of his um rules just by taking uh some things that were from the new york uh, state regulator there about what you'd be allowed to invest in there's some things that didn't allow any investment in common stocks thinking that investments in like preferred stock and stuff like that were generally just safer um so but the reason is just what state you're in different mm -hmm. states have totally different rules so we had uh, one question that was so i pulled one question that was emailed for the podcast uh, before we jump into our topic and to be able to 
do this and potentially have it on the podcast, email me, Andrew at focuscompound.com. And then in the subject, just put podcast. And then I group them together and then basically pull one question to go over on the podcast. Uh, and the question was, when valuing a company, how should investors think about which valuation method to use? Should investors primarily focus on relative valuations? And you put in parentheses, PE, EV to sales, et cetera. Or should that be more of an entry point to do more work? Eventually building out a DCF. Um, so I used all of them. I think the one that you should use is the one that makes common sense given the assets that you're looking at. But we just gave a great example of Cinemark, right? Mm -hmm. So you were comparing where it's at today to its basically 10 year average. Right. The reason why I'm doing that is because Cinemark, okay, so this is Cinemark is similar to the, the common stock of Cinemark is similar to a, um, uh, a, uh, preferred stock in which, um, if it's in arrears, it has to pay out to you basically. So the reason why it's similar to that, so it's cumulative, right? So there's cumulative and non-cumulative preferred stocks. Sometimes like in the depression and stuff, you had cumulative preferred stock, which owed a lot of money to pay people that it didn't have from before. And then you knew you were going to get paid that at some point, but the stock got very, very cheap. So Cinemark, I would say is similar to that unless they change their capital allocation in that they're going to produce a lot of cash flow and they're going to not want to build up any of it. They haven't had any history of doing that before. It's unlikely that they will do that. So as soon as they start earning, it may be a year or two lag as they rebuild some things and get comfortable with it, but whatever. Fairly early on, they'll start paying out very large amounts to you in dividends. So if you think about it, you're basically saying, I think that this preferred stock or this bond, however you want to describe it, you know, is not paying any yield basically now and hasn't in the last year or two, but will soon be paying a yield that's quite large. And then what is that yield versus my a price that I'm entering at? And how far forward does it go? And it's basically perpetual. You know, it pays it forever. Um, so I would pay a, put a very high valuation on something like a preferred stock or a bond that had not paid any um, interest in the last year or two and did not intend to for the next year or two, but from that point on was going to pay like 11% or higher. And by the way, St. Mark's is going to go up over time. So if you're going to be given a 10% real yield, let's say in year three or something, you pay a high price for it. And that's all that I'm saying. Uh, and that's why I think that that math works for it. Um, it would be different if the company was reinvesting it, but I don't see it as realistic to have big reinvestment opportunities. The company can obviously merge with another one of the giant companies if antitrust allows it. Um, you can also now, because of the change in antitrust position since the Paramount decision, um, which you know had been in basically what the industry was operating under for the last 70 years, um, it's also possible that a studio can buy a movie theater, theoretically. I mean, it hasn't exactly been tried yet. but um, So... You could look at it as like a buyout, like an EV to EBITDA or something like that. But my inclination, it's a public company that you'd be buying into. It's been a public company for a while, um, would be just to look at it in terms of what dividends is going to pay you over time. So in that sense, you could say it's a DCF. Mm -hmm. um, I prefer they buy back their stock than pay dividends, but I don't think they will. So that's what I would focus on. Mm -hmm. And I think it looks very attractive on that basis because what other companies are going to pay even 5%. And that's like the most conservative valuation work you can do. Yeah. And part of the reason for that is uh, the industry is not growing. So we can debate whether the industry has shrunk and will permanently shrink. But basically, the industry has been about this size. There's some slight differences. But in terms of like on a per capita basis, we're talking about the industry being this mature about this size since about the late 1990s, maybe 1995, something like that. Um, I don't see much difference since then. It peaked sometime in the 90s, probably, in terms of cultural importance. So, you know, you're not the population growth in the US is not that big. Um, I just don't see that movie going will grow a lot. And even then, I don't think they'll need more locations, you know, to meet the same demand. So I don't think the industry will operate with a lot more locations. We just have no reason to believe there'll be a lot of investment in anything other than, you know, redoing existing locations and things like that. Um, if they start to use capital in a different way, then you have to worry about it, you know, and think about it in a different way. Uh, it's not how I'd look at like, I want to look, use dividends to look at like an insurance company or something because they're, they're reinvesting into a portfolio that's going to matter a lot. And then they're going to write based on that portfolio, you know, um, very different than something like a Cinemark, but a Cinemark is 
the kind of thing that you would do a DCF of. I'm not going to do a DCF of it, but that's the kind of thing that if you wanted to theoretically come up with the company, that would be appropriate for kind of your theoretical DCF actually working in the real world. Something like Cinemark would be closer to the truth. So you did hit on like EBD, EBITDA or thinking about if Cinemark were to merge with another movie theater as long as antitrust wasn't an issue. But he asks a question sort of along those lines. He says, similar to the above, how much weight should investors give to private market transactions and buyout offers of similar companies? For example, I often hear cable investors pointing out the gap between the public valuations of cable companies to the prices private equity slash infrastructure funds are paying for private cable companies. Um, it depends. I think that all these things, my feeling is that I don't value companies. I just need to know that I'm paying a price that's going to get me a good return. So if I know that everything's being acquired for a lot more in terms of a multiple than what I'm paying, then that's fine. Then I, you know, I don't need to know how much more. I don't need to know how valuable the company is. Um, that's not our job. We're not analysts, you know, we're just investors. So, uh, I think that those numbers can matter. There's a couple problems though. Sometimes the gap there, sometimes public valuations are higher than private valuations in an industry. And sometimes the reverse is true. Um, the reverse would be true when you have like a um, control premium or something like that, or when companies think that there's some synergies that could be accomplished by acquiring the company. So we've mentioned those, like when we did, when I did um, reports that I have at Hog, you know, singular diligence, when I did those, you know, I mentioned that a company like Movado or something would be worth more if acquired by a company like Swatch, you know, as part of a bigger um, watch company, there would be uh, certain synergies that would mean that it was trading at a low multiple of things like EV to sales and stuff like that, especially because the company could then use the cash by acquiring them and everything. So that's a control premium in there, but it's also um, the synergies that you would get. On like the cost size? On the cost side of things? Yeah, so there's a lot of synergies with merging watch brands together. Um, I think that it's attractive for many watch companies to have a variety of different brands. They're going to sell a lot of them through the same distribution systems. Um, and then also you have the LVMH type thing where you're combining your ad buys and stuff like that. Um, so there are a lot of synergies that way. Mm -hmm. And then you might also operate with more um, leverage. Uh, and obviously there are large manufacturing and distribution synergies because you're talking about things with fairly high um, values relative to the actual amount of stuff that goes into them. You know, they have high gross margin stuff, but also just they don't take up a lot of space, have a lot of weight, things like that. So you can actually do a lot of it through the same few locations. So you can see that if you look at Movado or something that they only use a few locations and then they outsource the rest of production. So someone could easily take on production for different brands. Um, so I think that, you know, there's higher value there for those kinds of companies um, if acquired by someone else. There's lots of industries where that's true. Um, but these valuations are tricky because one, you want a lot of different uh, valuations that you get. So a lot of different uh, transactions. And then I would also say that the transactions, at least a few things. One, the transactions are more reliable. I do think that private market transactions are more reliable than public valuations. Comparing one public company to another public company in terms of what they're valued like in the market doesn't make a lot of sense to me. 100% uh, control deal does make a little more sense to me. Um, to use that as a number of what someone would pay to acquire a company. I think that's much, um, much better. I put more faith in that. I put more faith in having 10 transactions of buyers, and then we take the median, you know, and the range and all that of um, a buyer paying to acquire a similar business than to compare this business is a 30% premium to this one, you know, saying, well, Tesla and Toyota are both car makers, so, and then comparing them, you know. Mm -hmm. I want to do that as much as um, looking at situations in which there's a healthy private market. Um, there's a problem, though, that for most industries, you know, they mention uh, cable, which makes a lot of sense, but for cable systems. But for most pri uh, for most industries that you're talking about that are big industries, there actually aren't good comps. Um, and that becomes a problem. So like um, car dealerships, we have a bunch of comps. That's not hard to find a bunch of what do car dealerships sell for. Now, car manufacturers, they don't get sold. 
So we don't have comps. And and even if we did, it would be messy in terms of all the politics involved and everything. So they're just too big. The industry's gotten too big. So we don't have that kind of information anymore. Um, but things that are very similar assets, I would say, yeah. So if you're talking about, you know, dealerships, but also if we were talking about uh, barrels of oil, mines, whatever, as long as they're similar economic situation. Um, if you're saying a barrel of oil in this um, area of the country or whatever, you know, in the Permian Basin that goes for this much or whatever, then yeah, you can use that measure when comparing to other things. If you have a bunch of different like small independent things being bought out, it might be helpful. Yeah, just like you would in like a real estate transaction or something like that. I think replacement value and things like that are more useful, but I, I always included that kind of thing when doing reports on it. More on that. Um, somebody said, you talked about examining long-term stock returns as a way to verify a way of verifying other calculations of long-term returns on equity and moat. Some stocks like Berkshire, this is trivial since they neither issue dividends nor spinoffs nor other strange transactions. Some companies make this more difficult like NACO, which I also own in substantial size, primarily due to their Q220 purchase of the publicly traded royalty, which I thought was very revealing. They have spun off several large businesses, have multiple classes of stock, et cetera, which breaks most calculators. How do you calculate the historical total return in non-trivial cases? My own estimate is that they have returned 27% over a very long period of time. Y charts seems to have a pretty good calculator, which suggests the 20-year number is 38%. I have a hard time believing such high numbers, but I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And then he also said, P.S. Check out this awesome uh, set mine, mining company mug handmade in Marshall, oh, Texas. Look at that. Very nice. <laughs> so for people that think these questions are just mine, <laughs> uh, that's that's not my hand. That's not Jeff's hand. <laughs> we're, we're not married. So there you go. Um, but questions are, I guess this question is on calculating right. long-term. So I don't returns. know in the case of NACO, I did look at what their returns were and what I thought was before the spinoff. Um, they had spun off a couple companies, uh, Hamilton Beach Brands and High Street Yale being two obvious ones that people knew about from right before this. Um, also, a lot of these things don't have accurate calculations for certain kinds of other distributions like dividends and stuff. Um, they're most accurate for calculating the correct return on a stock that has a single a class of stock. Um, it's never paid out dividends, things like that. Like Berkshire is a perfect example. It should be able to, well, Berkshire now is more than one class, but Berkshire, if you're if it has the correct information for the one of the classes, um, is the best for figuring that out. Um, I don't really care like how much, you know, if they, how much value they've created exactly, but I do want to know sort of the story of it. And so the one thing I use the chart for uh, is only to use a very long-term chart and then to ask kind of have they created value or not. And, um, it's to help look at it in other ways besides just earnings, because sometimes a company might look like it has, um, you know, QuickFS has 20-year earnings for things that have been public for that long. So that's very helpful. Um, yeah, so if you look at this for just NACA, let's do an OTCM to see, compare it. So you can do the all, which is not all that NACA's been public. NACA's been public for um, 70 years or so. Um, but if we look at the, comp if you click compare and do S&P 500, we can see how they compare. So it says that their returns right now, that they're very similar. If you bought in the early 1990s, and held through today. Now, there are a few issues. If we go to, let's see, five year, would that have it or not quite? Mm, that's not quite long enough, right? You need to go one year further back than that. So um, anyway, uh, it, you would have to check to see what it looks like on the day of the spinoff. Uh, and so if you have on the day of the spinoff a big drop and it means it's not correctly calculating the fact that you got spinoff shares, which is almost certainly the case here. I don't know that for a fact, but um, which means that you then have to calculate in the value of um, uh, what you got, like in that case, Hamilton Beach brands uh, shares. So it also wouldn't necessarily bother me if a stock over such a long period of time is in line with the S&P 500. Uh, what would be interesting in this chart, you'll see, is that NACO has spent huge amounts of time below the S&P 500 since that purchase date. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, it's way below. And that's something that would stand out to me, um, that it spends a lot of time below that. Now, you also have to do it based on picking different dates to be careful about that. So you don't pick that one date, like the max date. Um, but the purpose of that is to see if maybe the stock actually hasn't created a lot of value over time. 
or if it has created a lot of value, but is in some way that's difficult to figure out based on earnings. Well, let's do, um, what's the ticker? FRPH. I think that's it. Uh, if you do it on the overview. Oh, you want it? On the top, I mean. Chart yeah. itself? Yeah, the chart itself. Would you be looking at NACO? Like, what are your thoughts on the fact that it's pretty consistently traded less than the S&P 500, under the S&P 500? Right. So you said that's something that would stand out to you. So like, what would your thought process be? Right. Would it be learning about what the business has done? Right. So I wouldn't give it much credit that? for now. So for instance, if we were to look at that chart, now that doesn't mean that NACO hasn't created a lot of value because like we said, it may not be capturing it from other things. But the fact that the stock is up a huge amount recently and the market is down is the explanation for why that happened. It happened one other time when NACO was up a lot. It hasn't been many years. We'll do some other ones so you can see what I mean. So this is FRPH hold, so FRP Holdings. And so this is the history here with Florida Rock and stuff like that. Very complicated company. Holds royalties on um, uh, aggregates, you know, on, on um, rock yeah. in uh, Florida and stuff like that. And then also has um, apartment, mostly uh, apartment um, type uh, developments. So let's look at the compare it over the full period. To the S&P s and is fine, yeah. So, as you can see there, it has beaten the S&P 500 and has been pretty consistently ahead of it if you bought it in the early 1990s and held through the beginning of the housing boom, basically, you know, through it starts beating it in early 2004 or something like that. I don't know the exact date that it has there. And but then it's ahead of the S&P throughout that whole period, basically. So that's a pretty good indicator that. If it's not trading at a really absurd price now, and it wasn't a really absurd price at the beginning, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, you could say, well, why not just use book value then? The problem with any of these is it's a little more complicated than that. Um, we could use, for a lot of companies, just earnings per share, right? So like if you took, I mean, Omnicom pays dividends, but if you took something like that, they basically don't have assets. They just buy back their stock, so they would need to see it show up in earnings. A lot of your tech companies and things, it has to be show up in the earnings per share over a long period of time or they're not creating value. But how do you determine it for companies that haven't earned anything for a long time? Um, that's very difficult. Uh, and then how do you determine it for companies that have also might be buying things? Like a good example, a really good example of this is like Marcus. So Marcus, we showed, doesn't hasn't really isn't really at a higher price than it was 20 some years ago, but it has different parts to the business that make it complicated. So like the movie theater business will show up as creating a lot of value as a, um, a lot of earnings, but won't have a lot of asset value. Whereas maybe the asset value will be recognized in the, um, in the hotel side of things, sure. right? Yeah. And so it complicates things when you have those different parts. Reading is the same way. They're on both sides. They're they're doing real estate things, and they're also doing, um, they're also doing the the movie theaters. A lot of times, people want a thing like, should I use EV to EBITDA or should I use book value? You use book value for certain kinds of companies. You use EV to EBITDA for others. And then there's companies where it's mixed. I'd say Berkshire is very mixed. Like if people say the PE for Berkshire, it doesn't. That's not really that accurate. Price to book. Price to book is kind of accidentally accurate, and Berkshire hasn't really said that price to book is accurate. Buffett hasn't said that Berkshire's price to book has ever really been an accurate indicator. What he said is that the change in price to book over time is, you know, is somewhat imperfect but acceptable for a long time idea of what the intrinsic value was mm -hmm. tracking at. And I would agree with that. That would make sense. And for some kinds of companies, the price to book, the change in price to book over time might make sense. In fact, I'd say price to book is often not a good gauge of the value of a bank, but over time, the change in price to book, when combined also with any dividend payment or whatever, um, may be a pretty good indicator of the return that you're getting in the stock, meaning that the changes in price to book over time might track fairly well with the stock. Um, and it's not bad at some insurance companies and some banks to use that as a proxy over a long period of time, even when I think that the actual price to book should not be close to one, it's still the case that there shouldn't be such a drastic change over time in the multiple. So it may be a better gauge over very long periods of time of the actual performance of the business and how much it's going up in value. Do you think a better representation of this would be total, total shareholder return as opposed to just the stock charts? So, okay, Berkshire doesn't pay dividends, but what about other companies? 
No, I like like the, NACO pays dividends. Right, but I like the stock chart a lot better for uh, because it's much more helpful to me. I don't care what the total return is. In fact, having a very high total return or low is not particularly uh, good or bad in me to deciding whether I want to buy into the one. You have the starting price being a major factor, a starting multiple, and the closing multiple that you have. So the dates that you pick. All right, that's one part. But two is that I can uh, look at it for the future of what I think the return on equity is going to be and all those sorts of things. I want to see if their capital allocation, all the things that they've done have created value or not. And I also want to see why did the stock fall off a lot in certain places. So let's do, um, let's see. Uh, well, let's do Twitter. So Twitter is a stock that hasn't really earned much in the way of anything. Um, it's had some small earnings, but we could do the max for Twitter, right? How far back do we yeah, go? We go? Yeah, back to 2013. And up right. 2013. So, and there may be other companies. I can't think of them right now, but are there other companies that have no earnings and have been public for a while and have gone up a lot? Um, well, I guess Tesla's even has earnings. Tesla nowadays. has earnings now, no. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we could just use Twitter. Yeah. So you can see that um, it... Obviously, it, it's about the same place that it was before. It's been under the S&P almost the entire time since it started. So if you bought Twitter on the IPO, now, of course, you could say, well, but pick a, a date much later. And so if you pick any date in the 2014 to 2018 period, maybe you're, you're doing a lot better. Um, you know, so for instance, you could be ahead in Twitter versus the S&P if you bought five years ago, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I think that that though doesn't necessarily show that Twitter's created a lot of value in the last five years. I don't know. But I think five years is too short a period to look at. What I like to look at, though, is why did these things happen in terms of huge increases or decreases in the stock? So normally when I look at a chart, what I can tell is if there was some bubble. Well, let's do Microsoft, okay? So this would be easy to look at just earnings and figure it out. But here, you should be able, if you go all, to see a bubble. Okay. So you can barely see it now. But you'll notice that there's a bubble in the 2000 period. Um, if we didn't have a more recent period, you can't even tell that because this isn't a log chart. So um, you can see that Microsoft is far outperformed over a long period of time. And then you would say, well, is it because the multiples went high in that period and all that? I like the very long term charts to be helpful for this. And I think it's most useful when looking at like a value type stock. What I'm trying to avoid in, is that I don't want to invest in a company that's had the same stock price from 1995 to 2022, um, unless I have reasons to believe that something has changed with the stock. And I also want to look at it to try to get at whether people are saying, well, it always trades with that. Because th that's an argument I've heard many times that people say, well, it always trades cheap or whatever. Mm -hmm. But there are some companies that always trade cheap and have, uh, we can look at Carmart, for instance. Carmart is usually traded cheaper, it's traded cheaper than the average stock and it's traded maybe in line more with a finance company than anything else. Um, but if you look at the chart, you can see that it has, um, what's its returns for, uh, Carmart since the 1990s. We have it up 26,000. Okay. Percent. Yeah. And you can pick other times that are earlier and see that it still would be doing fine. Um, I don't even think you really need the S&P except when going over very long periods of time, it's helpful for people to see the S&P. Um, but I never think that something as short as like five years is useful. I would never look at a five year chart. So you like 15, 10, 15, 15 is the shortest. 15 is the shortest that's useful. Because for most companies, they have extreme enough changes in valuation that a lot of your return over 10 years is still going to come from valuation change. 15 years or longer in a stock, a lot of it is going to come from the underlying business performance. Here, for instance, you can see the huge decline in the financial crisis, right? Is that the financial crisis there? Uh, no. That was 2020. Oh, 2020. So you can see it in COVID. Wow, it dropped way more than the S&P mm -hmm. during COVID. Financial crisis was in this area it looked like it did drop yeah um so you can but you can see the sharp drop over there again the problem here is that it will look because the chart is arithmetic like the in the gains are so large you can see that problem um so i think that it's helpful in figuring out those sorts of things about uh whether the stock has been creating value over time or not um however to me, it wouldn't matter if the stock ha looks like it hasn't created. So, for instance, let's say you went public in 1995 at 20 times earnings, and today you're at two times earnings. Then I don't mind if the chart shows that you haven't gotten anywhere. Mm -hmm. Because 
but that's an unusual kind of change, right? Um, what about these companies that have basically done nothing for forever. a long term? And let's say management said they're going to change their capital allocation, stuff like that. That's something that you would be interested in. You wouldn't rely so much on the past, like the right. stock chart. But and the other thing that's that's fascinating, so like Maui Land and Pineapple here, is of course that people think that it's been at the same price forever. Something actually had been at a really high price um, right before the the financial crisis, mm -hmm. and then dropped off after that. And uh, you can see that with some other things. And presumably the land. I mean, everyone says the land is worth more now than it was then. Um, but it's trading, so probably it's trading at 80% cheaper versus the value of the land than it was then. Um, so it's an interesting thing that way. Uh, it you know it, it might give you some idea of what's happened with the company. That's always what I'm looking at, of whether events happen that change things uh, and the history of the company. I just like the very long-term chart as a way to look at the history of the mm -hmm. company um, because I'm trying to think of ones that people mention some value things. Um, well, let's see. Okay, so here too. So in the Twitter thing, some ones we didn't answer were HBI. I know someone asked about Haynes Brands. So I had talked about Haynes Brands when it was spun off. So when we do the all, we can see all the way back to when it was spun off. So it's been, it's got to be close to 15 years now since it was spun mm -hmm. off or something. It's not quite that long, maybe 13, no more than 13. So um, I had written about it in a newsletter that I did even before Singular Diligence when I had a newsletter for like under a year and I found it too hard to uh, find stocks then. That was the end of um, sort of the boom right before the financial crisis. It was the year before the financial crisis. And so that was one of the things I picked. It was a spinoff uh, and I was going to write about it and stuff. And then while I was doing that, I decided that was part of the experience. I just said, I got to shut this down and not do it because there's just can't find things. Um, but Haynes Brands is interesting and in, you can compare it to S&P. Um, in seeing like, for instance, okay, so say you bought it then, how much time did you spend ahead of the S&P 500? Basically all of it. I mean, there's little blips where you're not, but mm -hmm. if you had bought the stock when it spun off, you would always, if you had chosen to sell randomly on any day, you died and your state had to be settled. Um, you'd have a gain mm -hmm. for almost, you know, entirely, except for a few months in a few different places, um, that we can see on the chart, but that includes most recent months, last few months, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then you just look at the multiples and things like that. And the multiples aren't crazily high, but they're also crazily low for Haynes Brands. Um, so that gives you some idea. But you can also see that there's this huge increase in the stock price in the middle of that period. And then how far it's come down. So you don't need a lot of information of someone telling you how high it once traded. It did trade very high on multiples and stuff at one point. And, you know, it is here now. The reason why that's useful for something like Haynes Brands is that it uses some debt. It makes acquisitions. People always ask, like, do I charge goodwill for the company? Like, do I look at the return on equity with goodwill? No, I don't. But that shows up in the stock price. So it matters to you as an investor in the company, how it does with the goodwill. But you are not buying any goodwill when you buy into a company. W whatever its return on those things were in the past doesn't matter. The return on the tangible capital is likely to be representative of what it will be in the future, much more likely, than the return on their acquisitions unless you're buying and thinking they're going to keep making those same kind of acquisitions and then you want to avoid it. So a lot of companies that make acquisitions, I find that really helpful. Um, we can look at the other one that, is, that was asked for on Twitter there was AGM. It was Farmer Mac. Mm -hmm. So if we go on this one looking at the chart... All right, so this is gained enough now that it's hard to actually see. But the thing that's interesting here, which you'd have to go back in the history and look at is, I think the performance of this stock could have been a lot better if not for what happened in the financial crisis. So they were sidetracked by a one-time event, which sent them off of trend for a very long time. And that that loss of so much uh, equity, that so much you know dilution and things like that, um, caused them a real problem from which to come back from was was difficult. And they've done it. They, had, they didn't go under, but they basically were bailed out. And uh, that's what you're seeing in the chart. And so you would have a better result if it wasn't for that event. And you see that on the chart. It's very large. Um, and then you'd have to go and learn about it. So like, was that just a psychological thing? Is that like a, a decline that happened because there was a lot of um, – optimism in the stock and then decline well you go back and you learn about it and if you go back and learn about this company you'll see that it wasn't just that 
it actually took a big hit on the balance sheet and everything, and that changed its performance. And so maybe we'd be at a different price today if it wasn't for that happening. That permanently changed the performance of the company. But then you ask, well, will that continue to be the case? You look at what the current management is, what their plans are, whether financial crisis like that is common or not so common, that sort of thing. And then try to decide whether you think that the actual um, uh, that it would be, have been a better compounding stock than it seems to be if it had, could have avoided that crisis or whether that kind of crisis will happen a lot. And um, it zeroes in your attention on that issue in that time period, mm -hmm. which I think is very useful that way. And so I think the charts are very helpful that way in seeing those very big moves. Um, they give you some idea of trying to find an explanation for why they have or have not created a lot of value. And especially what if their business model is acquiring other businesses. So I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts on these companies where their sole business is to buy other businesses, roll them up, what your thoughts are on that. I mean, obviously we talk about Berkshire Hathaway a lot mm -hmm. and that's their main business model. Um, but what are some things that you look for when you come across these companies? Do you like investing in stocks? That I don't think acquire so. a bunch of other businesses. That's their main but, well, business model. Yeah. Why do investors like these companies so much? Well, it can be very effective. Mm -hmm. uh, it can definitely be very effective. So one way to think about it is some businesses, their business model is to just, their business is essentially acquiring other businesses. Mm -hmm. And then you leave those businesses alone to run themselves. Or you send someone in, usually in the early years or early year, um, to kind of implement the kind of changes that you want. Uh, you, you know, you're the playbook for an acquisition um, to bring them in line. And then there's a lot less attention paid to them in later years. Um, if we look at some of these companies that you have there, you'll see that their results have been, you know, some of them have been very good um, in terms of the earnings per share growth that they're able to get and things like that. So a favorite Constellation software. Mm -hmm. And it's run for free cash flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you ever read the book Lessons from the Titans? No, I don't no. think so. It's a good book that kind of talks about this topic when they acquire other businesses and then going in and improving the operations and different things that companies look to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, the big difference between Buffett and what some of these other companies do, which you talk about all the time to me privately, is Buffett won't make an acquisition unless the CEO is going to stay. Right. A lot of times people go in to these situations and they're going to replace management shake up the company a little bit that's not the buffett playbook he wants basically everything to be the same it's just either for estate planning or whatever the reason is right the management they love their business they love work they are still going to be ceo of the company mm -hmm. and uh many companies that you know capital cares that buffett admires henry singleton and teledyne um tom murphy capital cities they both were serial acquirers, you know? That'd be a good question for him. Who is the capital allocator that you admire? Oh, he would say Tom Murphy. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe Henry Singleton. Mm -hmm. If they said best CEO, he would say Tom Murphy probably. But if you said capital allocator, he might say Henry Singleton. Um, so strong EPS growth though, right? So their business model is acquiring right. the companies, rolling them, I, centralizing the process. Yeah. Shipping the cash flow up to the mothership. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a book I talked about, Distant Force, which talks about Teledyne. Uh, the Outsiders talk about several companies that did this kind of thing. I think it's a strategy that can make a lot of sense. Yeah. So in the case of Constellation, they're buying other software companies. And then the idea is they're slower growth companies. And um, then that can focus on free cash flow instead of earnings. And then you can use that cash flow to do other things with it. Um, and they've had a lot of success for a long time. And they have, um, I believe you can find the letters uh, to shareholders on their website, like going back for a pretty long distance. I've read mm -hmm. uh, them in the past. Yeah. Are there certain things that you like to see when you're looking at these type of companies? Is it, I mean, is there like an acquisition strategy that you like to see? Do you like to see them using free cash flow to do it? Is there like a red flag when you see them issuing stocks well, through these deals? The theoretical thing would be to leverage up using debt and then to pay down that after you make the acquisition and doing it over and over again 
Uh, it also depends on what we mean by like serial acquires and stuff. We talked about Stella Jones. That is what the business would be able to have nothing by just serial acquisition. I mean, it was basically consolidating the industry. So, um, yeah, I think that those strategies can make sense. Uh, there are a few issues with it. Some of the best capital allocation, some of the worst has both been from serial acquirers. Um, it's also something that has the best and worst sort of um, promotional aspects to it. It's where Buffett came from, but it also he based it on a bunch of people in the earlier conglomerate period, some of who did um, things that kind of got their stocks caught up in bubbles, and things like that, and uh, and didn't last very long afterwards. Um, it It's difficult it, because it's very, very effective at a small scale, but then obviously it attracts a lot of investor attention over time and it becomes harder and harder to find things to buy at acceptable prices. And you have to keep buying bigger and bigger things as the biggest issue for Berkshire for any of these. And so you slow down dramatically and then you may try to do things to maintain the same level of uh, growth. And so that's an issue. What about a company like Valiant? And what they were doing, and then you compare well, that to like a constellation. That's the difficulty. Trans time, right? So that's the difficulty for me. Is I, it's hard for me to tell the difference between like constellation and valiant because I don't know enough about the industries, and I don't know enough about whether you can take these things over and then not reinvest a lot in like R and D and things like that, and then how much do their sales drop off over time? Like how durable is it? Mm -hmm. um, when you're talking about something like trans dime, that's less of an issue. There's not a, a lot of innovation in their um, industry. I should say there's high, I shouldn't say it that way. There's very high durability for each model and things like that, each part. Have you ever invested in a company that was rolling up an industry or consolidating an industry? No, I would say no. No, I invested in some that were grown largely through acquisition probably and continue to do some acquisitions. Um, a lot of them were created that way. Even when we talk about something like Omnicom or something, it's all the publicly traded ad agencies were basically created that way. They were created by merging some things together and then buying some more stuff over time. Some, I mean, serial acquisition, they always acquire things, all of them, mm -hmm. very small. Um, and then you also have uh, occasional big acquisitions. Yeah. How do you think about like valuations when looking at these companies? It seems like they always trade at a premium. In the market, right? That's the thought process. You get they your market multiple, and then you buy companies for less than a market multiple, and that's immediately accretive to your market valuation. Yeah, I would say um, that they do not always trade at a premium. Uh, they trade at a premium when they're in favor, and they trade at a discount when they're out of favor. Um, I think there's a, been a substantial discount in, in Stake and Shake, for instance, in Big Larry Holdings mm -hmm. at times. And uh, they're not doing something that's different than the strategy of some other companies that do the same thing. It's just that investors hate that company, you know. Um, well, why do they hate that company? Well, a variety of things. They don't like the CEO. Uh -huh. um, they <sighs> poor performance, uh, poor stock performance and things like that are also a factor, too. Um, Is their insurance company good? They have a couple insurance companies, yeah. Are they good insurance companies? They have. What about the magazine business? It's not losing money. Uh huh. So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, the insurance companies that they have uh, had very good operating histories, certainly. Um, and they also bought um, Oil, a company that I'm sure made very large profits for them. Uh, which was probably unexpected how large the profits were that came from it. So um, that one, though, is most similar to Berkshire. It's completely diversified conglomerate, just random purchases that reflect the the um, personality and the circle competence and stuff of the uh, head of the company. Mm -hmm. So you have strange things like that. You have Maxim and the same thing that you have insurance companies and the same thing that you have restaurants because that's, you know, his history, investing in restaurants, and then also making other purchases uh, – um, like that, yeah. So you had spoken about Constellation, how you could read the shareholder letters from Mark Leonard. I'm kind of curious. I mean, so that would probably be a huge focus for you if you're going to ever invest in these companies is right. who's controlling the capital and what's their capital allocation policy, what's the CEO, his thoughts on markets, what are his thoughts on valuation, buying businesses. I mean, similar to how we basically always go over a lot of what Buffett says, 
Um, because if you're going to invest in Berkshire, you probably want to understand the person that's captaining the ship, especially mm -hmm. if the main business is acquiring other companies. Yeah. Uh, I think that's true. I've had trouble understanding a lot of the companies better than I feel other people understand them. You're trusting a lot on how they present things, which is the same thing with Buffett at Berkshire. I don't think I have very good insight into Berkshire and understanding how it works and, and, and um, all that, except for how Buffett chooses to present it. So I don't know that we have a lot of information on that. Um, and that's a much larger company. So I don't think we have good ideas of trends inside of things in that company. Um, yeah, because it's tough because how many subsidiaries does Berkshire have? Mm -hmm. But how much of their business really is a couple companies now? So like what do the other businesses look like under the umbrella? Yeah, and a lot of them are grouped together. So it's harder to tell it apart. Now, something like Big Larry Holdings, it's all broken out, basically. I mean, the company's small enough that it, it can be like the early days of Berkshire. Um, and so you can make some independent judgments that way. Uh, all right. I'm just not knowledgeable enough about the things that they're doing, you know, in terms of their acquisitions uh, with these companies. I just don't feel like I understand it well enough. I mean, most all the things that I read seem to be based on what the company is presenting as their criteria for acquisitions, uh, the returns that they get on Great an acquisition. Return on asset capital. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It always looks like a very nice investor presentation. Yeah. And the results are you know, very good um, for those where it's working. Um, obviously, then when it reverses, um, you know, then then it sometimes just a very large discount. Um, what are some that reversed? Uh, well, I mean, you mentioned Valiant that really like blew up, but um, the um, funeral services companies in the U.S. Mm -hmm. were all formed out of, um, of a lot of mergers, a, a constant serial acquisition stuff. Um, Monish was involved in those. A long time ago, there was a co the company doesn't, you can type in CBIZ. Uh, they had been a serial acquirer a very long time ago, and now I don't know how slowed down they've been. Revenue is 6 to 7%. They can't be doing a lot of acquisitions if it's that low. Mm -hmm. So the company must have changed its approach over time. Um, do we see what, can you see what the share count has done over time? Yeah. It's gone from 49 million in 2012 to 53 million. Yeah. So, um, where's the cash going? Let's go to the cash flow statement. There is a fair amount of acquisitions in some years. Yeah. A good amount. I mean, basically yep. all or more of uh, cash flow from operations. So, would you call that a serial acquire if it uses most of its cash flow from operations to, buy, to acquire? acquire? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. So, in the CBIS, that's a. One right there, that's a uh, serial acquire. It used to be a, no, I mean, a long time ago, it was probably, well, we can look at the stock chart and see, or, or known better is to look. Um, oh, we have 20 years, right? Do we have that for even valuation stuff on QueerFS? Yeah, we can pull that. Okay, so if we look at that, you might see if it used to have a higher, if it used to have a acquire type valuation. It, I remember it being a more popular stock a long time ago, but I could be wrong about that. So do you have things like the price multiples? Mm -hmm. Price to earnings. Mm. Yeah, it it's of, always been pretty uh -huh. much the same. Twenty some, yeah. So, yeah. So there you go. That's just a require right there. Are there certain things like red flags that would stand out to you in a company like this? Well, there's a few things that are interesting. Uh, one huge one that I just mentioned is if they're doing a lot of acquisitions and their revenues are only growing six to seven percent a year, then it would seem that their same office revenue is probably declining. Um, it depends on how big those acquisitions are versus the size of the company, but it seems possible. So what does that mean? Well, like, well, so like same, same store sales. Right. However, we can see that that's not a problem in terms of their operating margin has gone up, basically has gone up and earnings per share have gone up. So the business has gotten better over time. Um, is that because they're buying better things over time or is it because they've improved operations over time? Have they improved operations without improving revenue growth at existing locations? Um, but I also don't, there's nothing wrong with doing it this way um, where you only get growth of this level and it's mostly through acquisitions. I mean, um, you know, Walmart or something doesn't grow as fast as this. Um, and... A lot of big companies. Um, so, 
I, I just, it's obviously, we can look at the stock chart because this is something that we just said to look at the stock chart sometimes for companies that have um, a lot of uh, acquisitions over time. And that's what this company is doing. So this goes all the way back to 2005 mm -hmm. at around $4 per share. So it's been a ton bagger. Yep, 10 bagger. And so, have they paid dividends along the way? No, I don't believe they've no. paid dividends ever. Nope, doesn't look like it. Yep. So that's a smaller example. What are we up to on this? A couple billion dollar market cap? Mm -hmm. But I think it was only a few hundred billion. million dollar market cap, you know, within the last, what? It, let's see how far up it's gone. So I don't know, five to 10 years ago, this was a micro cap pretty much. 200 million. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it hasn't had tremendous growth in sales or things like that. So you could read about that, about what their strategy is and why they grow that way. Um, the If you read the business description, it's clear that they're in things that are pretty mature. So I think that they have to acquire um, uh, companies that are already, you know, um, uh, companies that aren't going to grow much after you acquire them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a business services stuff, like, you know, accounting type stuff. It describes it as financial services, benefits, and insurance services, as well as national practices. So um, it's like smaller business um, uh, or medium, whether you, whatever you want to call it. What are your thoughts on like a Liberty or like a John Malone where they mm -hmm. constantly spin off companies and then have tracking stocks and stuff like that? It's hard to track them. You watch their capital allocation, see if what they're doing is smart. Um, a lot of them are doing very smart things in industries, and I don't really understand. Um, you know, I, I don't understand the industry that well, so I can make a judgment on it. This is something that I could understand, you know. Um, but something in cable or, or something like that, it would be harder for me to understand, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if something was rolling up movie theaters, you know, we're not at that point where you can really do that anymore. Um, but that's something that I could probably understand fairly well enough. If you're rolling up um, um, car dealerships, you know, things like that. Have you ever looked at WSO before, Watsco? Mm, read the business description. Distributes air conditioning, heating, refrigeration, equipment, and related parts and supplies. No, I don't think I know this company well. I'm not sure I know this company at all. Yeah, people talk about it. Um, what about Donna? Donna? Her? Yeah. Um, or waste management. That's another. Right. So waste one. Right. Waste management is a good example. Most of the large, um, I mean, waste management is an extreme example, but because it's kind of like the same as, um, was it AutoNation? Um, mm -hmm. Same sort of model. Uh, of a serial acquisition is kind of born from that from the beginning. Um, But waste management hasn't really been a serial acquirer in the last 10 years, right? Yeah. They had issues as well. Didn't they run into like fraud issues? They ran into some issues. Does it seem like companies that do a lot of roll ups, there's uh, chances for well, I more of a chance for those issues there's, because there's you're doing a lot of financial a little, engineering? Well, yeah. Yeah. One, the accounting is much more demanding. Um, two, there are certain things that you can do if you want to, to the easiest, I mean, there's different ways that you can manipulate accounting, but one of the easiest ways is through acquisition accounting. So if you were wanting to do things that would be confusing to people, the easiest way to do it is through that kind of thing. You can also do it through, um, I mean, acquisitions are probably the easiest way to do it, but also anything that's transaction-based type stuff and anything that's very difficult, um, large transactions, that's very difficult to understand the business then makes it much more susceptible to um, fraud, to bad accounting and things like that. It, it's the easiest way to detect fraud is if the business is easy to understand and is in kind of a stationary state. You know, if it's in the kind of a steady state and is easy to understand, then it's very hard to have a fraud. You know, people always ask, could this be a fraud or or that? It's not that easy in a lot of cases because we can look and check. And the only way that they could trick us about those sorts of things is by lying about things that are fairly easy to test on the ground. You know, when you have a business like that. Um, now, sometimes analysts are kind of willing to to be fooled by some of that stuff. But, you know, it's not very easy to um, say you're 
a supermarket with a few locations or something and you don't ever do acquisitions, it's not that easy to um, represent your earnings and things like that as radically different than they really are. Um, because it would be easy to, to check them, mm-hmm. right? So like Walmart and Target and stuff report their inventory. I saw what the inventory looked like, you know? And um, if they said that that's what the inventory looked like and then you were there and it didn't look like that, then that would be a pretty easy way to detect the fraud. But at things like Valiant and um, Enron and things like that, there's no hope because you don't even understand what it is that the company's doing and they use a lot of different... Um, more complex transactions. The easiest thing also to manipulate is revenue type stuff and then stuff that you book in terms of acquisitions. But revenue is significantly easier to um, manipulate than, say, gross profit, for instance. And so there are different signs of potential manipulation, but one of them would be um, disconnects between revenue and gross profit. Um, them going in very different sorts of trends and not having a business explanation for why that's happening. With acquisitions, you can hide almost anything because it's very difficult to know whether we're seeing changes in the businesses that you already have causing this or changes in the business that you have. And then you also are making adjustments to acquisitions you already made. And also the new acquisitions that you have, it can get very messy and it's very easy to kind of... um, manipulate things that way but i think the biggest reason is probably there's a lot of incentive to do it one these are people who are engaged in financial engineering from the first part and that's why their investors are with them two in some cases you're using your stock as a currency Mm -hmm. so you need to keep your stock up so you're worried about the stock price and then also even if you're not doing that you need to protect your credit rating to be able to use that to do the acquisitions so if you're using your um cash flows only and things like that then um it wouldn't the demand for it wouldn't be as important um to there wouldn't be as much pressure to manipulate things and have fraud and stuff like that um so there's somewhere kind of understand why they got themselves into cases with fraud and then there's others where i don't really understand why and that they felt the need to do that it's funny you look at these companies like enron ge all these companies cared so much about their stock price their Mm -hmm. dividend basically how everybody else in the market viewed their company because they would use their stock to do all these different things. Yeah. And then a common thing with frauds is um, we don't know how many like small fraud stuff is undetected and everything. But what happens with frauds, the kind of iron rule of fraud stuff is that it has to snowball. Almost all frauds by design can only be continued if they snowball. There's almost, they're very hard to unwind. Most methods of fraud are hard to unwind. So in larger companies and stuff, they can be somewhat disguised and you can have a whole, if there was a one-time thing where you drew from something to pull something forward. But otherwise, it's going to have to keep getting bigger and bigger. And then a lot of those things happening in the same organization, you know, leads to potentially more problems that way. Like culture issues? Uh, well, having, yeah, I mean, that that's true, but having, um, things that subsequent frauds are basic, subsequent acts of fraud are there to cover earlier ones. Oh, I got you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, this has been the case in most of, not most, but in a lot of the Japanese fraud stuff is to co- is to not, uh, take a large charge for a mistake made in the past, covering up that mistake if things don't go well, can become very difficult in later periods. It can get quite large. And so the only way to do that is to do certain things to smooth it out and stuff like that. And um, there's all sorts of books that you can read about those sorts of things. Like the, Although it's a big example of it, that kind of fraud is the Olympus fraud in uh, Japan. It's a pretty good example of why you would have that kind of issue come up. It's basically trying to, it's committing a lot of fraud over time um to hide basically a mistake that you made and losing a lot of money and not wanting to admit that you did that um but some of the others are difficult to understand why they um were done you know um some of it is opportunity to do it some of it is compensation for it but i don't think that we should talk about like um fraud in relation to companies that do roll-ups and stuff it's just you know um there's no reason why they has to be associated with companies that do that Mm -hmm. um it is in some cases, sure. You know, the probably one of the most famous examples would be Tyco. When I said about the acquisition accounting stuff, that's basically what Tyco did. Um, because you can get people to ignore it. You know, you can manipulate things how you want and say that this is the continued operating stuff. Um, and that's a pretty clear example because a lot of what they were doing were legitimate businesses. 
Um, and it, the fraud was in the actual pre presentation and the financial engineering of it, you know? Yeah. I remember Valiant now Bosch health companies. I mean, at one point the stock was $250 a share and today $9 and 87 cents a share. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, you know, um, it's similar to like the, I mean, it's a huge scale thing, but it's similar to what happened with like the conglomerate stuff, like I was saying with Buffett, where he learned about how conglomerates work. That conglomerate era was a lot of this sort of thing of getting better earnings by um, repeating the same thing over and over again. Um, but y I mean, you can certainly do it. I mean, private equity firms do this kind of thing all the time. They don't do it by putting one company on top like of another and top of another. Right. But they just get out of it and then repeat the same process. That is easier, and they end up returning a lot more money that way and stuff. Um, that is easier to do than trying to repeat the same thing over and over because of the problem that you get from the asset size ballooning. Um, right. So you do this once in one company and then say your runway works for 10 years of doing this or whatever. Where for private equity thing, you're done by 10 years. Sometimes it might be done a lot earlier than that. But that gives you an opportunity to repeat this if you need to in one industry and then you know, you can sell that business and start over in something else. Um, you don't have to keep doing in the exact same thing. Berkshire got around this problem a different way, but the same idea, instead of giving back all the money and stuff, sort of like a limited um, lifetime kind of thing like private equity, it went on forever so far, but it's done that by going into all sorts of different businesses over time, businesses that are totally different from the businesses that Berkshire, or that Buffett ever would have been in. I mean, their biggest things are like railroad and energy, are things that he'd never in the early days that's the furthest from what Berkshire would have ever been involved with. So you see the same sort of pattern play out and you can see the slowing down in the growth rate and stuff. If he had wanted to kind of maintain that early, what, 30% a year or something that he was doing to maintain that at very high size, you know, that's why you have to kind of stretch in different ways to achieve that. Mm -hmm. So if you were to look at one, what are some things that you would want well, to? The biggest issue for me is I need simplicity. So the tricky one about Valiant and Transdime to some extent too, because Transdime, some of their, them are sole supply um, government, mm -hmm. right? Which is a little tricky. Um, not just government, but other businesses too, but stuff that goes into government things, you get, uh, as right, what happened to them so. is you get, you get attention from, from politicians, yeah. Um, and the same thing with, um, with healthcare. So those are tough for me, you know, when you have defense businesses or healthcare businesses uh, anyway, but it would have to be businesses pretty simple because I have to be able to understand it, understand what they're doing and understand that's repeatable. So most like, for instance, Constellation Software might be a wonderful company. I don't think I could understand the businesses that they're acquiring. And I don't think I could understand sort of the decay rate and stuff of what happens if you do put in money or don't put in money in them. Um, I could understand some of them, but they have so many different um, businesses that they own that it would be really hard for me to be able to uh, understand it as a business. Makes you think too, if you're ever gonna get the opportunity to buy Constellation at 10 to 15 times earnings, did they blow up? Did something happen? Yeah, so usually that's what happens. I can't think of a lot of cases where um, you I mean, just look at gradually come down to a reasonable multiple. It's always trade at a premium. Well, that's price to earnings, yeah. Even but price to book, price to sales. Well, price to sales, not as high, I guess. Yeah, I mean, price to sales, four to five times is kind of reasonable for mm -hmm. a software company, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they don't have very good organic growth, right? But yeah. they've achieved that growth through acquisitions. So if we look at their overview, what's their like um, growth rates? Yeah, I mean, so obviously if you're growing, you know, revenue, assets, free cash flow by high 20% or something, then you would have very high PE ratios, very high. I mean, the EV to EBITDA, this says is only 20. Mm -hmm. EV to free cash flow is only 25, 26. Um, so PE is very high, but that's reported earnings, which they may not care about. Um, so, and even that is growing at 10% a year, which isn't exactly a growth stock. My problem is just like, I don't know at what time it would stop because you're not betting very heavily on, I think, organic revenue growth. So I need to have a lot of ideas of whether they keep repeating this. And they're a very large company. Mm -hmm. So keep repeating it. Uh, the capital allocator, mm -hmm. you reference reading uh, their shareholder letters just to get their ideas on capital allocation. Yeah. Again, what is it? Is it a simplicity thing? Is it how they just think about investing 
in general? What are some things that you would look for? Well, you're really betting on the person. Correct. So yeah. you're betting that the person doing this or the organization doing this in some cases, it's a few people, um, are honest, are candid, you know, they're transparent with their investors and everything and presenting a certain way. And that you understand their incentives about what they plan to do for a long time, especially reputational incentives that they're realistic about, the risk that they may blow up, and um, that they'd be very concerned about that, right? Mm -hmm. So it would be like someone deciding they want to invest with Buffett because they knew him as a person and that's what they want to do. They don't really understand what he's doing, but they're going to go ahead and do it. Uh, it would be the same sort of thing here um, because I don't know that you can ever get that much insight into the businesses. And then it doesn't really matter because they're going to allocate so much cash flow into other businesses. Um, do you think you have to like the actual industry that they're rolling up? For example, we've come across restaurant companies that mm -hmm. they own and acquire other restaurant businesses sure and that you would look at that a little bit different than you would probably look at a software company yeah well i i think um i don't know my experience has been when i'm thinking about what companies i've looked at or owned or analyzed or whatever that do the serial acquiring stuff they've been in very simple businesses and it often has not turned out that well um, in that the growth doesn't go that they're, they're not able to achieve very good growth when acquiring other things. Um, performance is a little worse after they acquire them. In some cases also just not enough opportunities to buy other things. And so they end up trading at low multiples and things like that. And then you use a lot of the free cash flow for that, as opposed to paying it out in dividends or buybacks or something like that. So, um, I don't know if that's a better alternative than like, growing yourself through doing uh, other locations. Certainly let's take restaurants, you know, we've talked about Arc or something like that. For the same company, I would much rather that you had a company like uh, a company trading at a certain multiple or whatever in restaurants that had a concept that it could roll out and had free cash flow. I'd much rather that than something that was acquiring. You know, I, I, you know I, I'd rather something that's the same chain and, and growing that way. You know, mm -hmm. I'd, rather, I'd rather buy into an Olive Garden at the right price um in a state where you, in a, at a time when you could open more olive gardens than to invest in something that's just going to acquire other things and doesn't have chains you know that it can grow nationally it's an easier way to figure out how to grow mm -hmm. um to, and to count on that growth over time it has a business model that can be repeated it's much more predictable is what you're saying you could roll it out i guess but these companies have that is their their business is acquiring mm -hmm. other businesses so they're actually are repeating the same thing i mean it's what tillman for tita does right acquires other restaurant chains yeah so these companies are, are repeating the same thing of looking for the same kinds of companies acquiring them and um and, and that is their actual business more so than the business of operating these things and probably there's a certain point at which they have to get to a certain size and so maybe it's not good to look for very small companies doing this that might be one of the other lessons that mid-sized companies might be the best to do because of like a scale thing mm-hmm yeah yeah i but think there yeah. are i mean we do know of a few companies whether they're rolling up financial advisory firms accounting firms mm -hmm. which are smaller businesses and the business model still works yeah and it's possible i just think that um well, because there's a few reasons. Also, if you're a bigger company, then you're more likely to get attention to your stock. If you get attention to your stock, you're more likely to be able to use your stock as currency. You're more likely to be valued in the public market much higher than the private market. So mm -hmm. you can acquire things that way and arbitrage that. So that's probably a significant portion of the possibility that you might have. Whereas if you're paying things entirely from free cash flow or something like that, you don't have that advantage. Um, so uh, those would be some of it. And then also maybe attracting the right kinds of people to work in headquarters to do these deals, the right kinds of accountants, basically, um, to do these things. Look at the shares outstanding for Berkshire. Does not change. Yeah, it's changed a couple times in its history, and that's about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, You'd much rather see businesses do it like that as opposed to using stock, right? So using actual cash flow. Well, I don't know. I mean, you should use cash. You should use stock when it makes sense to use stock, and you should use cash when it makes sense to use cash. Um, 
the problem, of course, is that means that you're in a stock that's expensive. If if using the stock makes a great deal of sense, um, yeah, because it's cheaper currency than cash. Or yeah, better when Berkshire than cash. issues stock to a company in acquisition, he's telling Buffett's telling you that the stock is too expensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's part of why they did the Genry deal. Probably is that um, he gets to swap a lot of his um, stock for bonds, basically, and is able to do it at a time when Berkshire's trading at a high um price you know at a different point in time you want to do the same deal uh certainly i mean you can do very well if you time those things right teledyne did if you use stock at the points where that would make a lot of sense for you and then use cash others it's also the one of the reasons why i've been cautious about banks that do a lot of acquiring um while there's some things that they can do well most of the banks that i've seen that can do a lot of acquiring and have a lot of success in um in getting really good returns over time are basically taking advantage of the fact that they're able to get their stock to a price to book to deposits things like that relative to others who once integrated into the business work the same way uh of other companies and so basically they're using the premium price to book ratio that they have versus a discounted price to book of their companies they're acquiring and then they bring them to converge with their own operations mm -hmm. and so they're basically taking something that's valued less you know and saying well it's actually can be turned into the same thing and repeating that process and then eventually they get to a size where it doesn't work or the market turns on them in a way that their stock value goes down and you think oh well this is a good time to buy the stock but now the the acquisition um uh alchemy that they were doing doesn't work with your price to book at a the same level or lower than other banks so that's the problem that they run into and so you have this very strange thing that happens that way um so it's been easier to find companies that aren't very growth oriented that are value stocks than companies that are, have a lot of acquired growth that they can do mm -hmm. have yeah have you ever invested in a bank that their business model is acquiring other banks we've written up banks that did that I mean, an issue with all of these, uh, there's sort of, here's the big issue. Um, so serial acquires generally, if you know that they have a few years left, a certain number of years left, doing the same thing and it's going to work, you're going to get very good returns and it's going to be worth it even if you hold it for a very long time because the returns are going to be so high in the next 10 years or whatever that it's all going to work out for you. However, when it stops the multiple contraction is usually huge i mean we can let's go and quick fast and look at some of the multiples on these stocks so what are the stocks that people asked about we got transdime okay. constellation software waste management all right. her. all right so transdime uh okay um if we just look at the um you want the overview page the overview for each of these yeah let's do the overview. Okay. So let's see. Um, yeah, I mean, the multiple isn't that high right now. EVD, but it's what, 13 times? Mm -hmm. That's not bad. Although EVD, EBIT is 15. That's not that much higher. Hmm. Um, so it's at what? It says 5.8 times. That's not right. Yeah. So I don't know. Something's wrong with the quick as, as numbers, I'm pretty sure. We can look up um, another fan favorite, Donner. Mm hmm. Yeah, you look at EBIT EBITDA 20 times, EBIT EBIT 26 times. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I mean, the what's the 10 year EPS is 10%. Maybe there are reasons that EPS is not so. No, there's not. I don't know. I mean, close to 30 times earnings for something that's growing 10% a year. I feel like you could find other things that are growing that can grow 10 to 12% a year and that trade at half of that or lower. So when you said if you could find Not in that one, size range, you can't find $200 billion one. You got to find $2 billion or something. Mm -hmm. If you find one that you feel like has a few years left, you're basically saying where they still have a runway. They're not a $200 billion company. You think like if it's like a well, I don't know. I think for some company. companies at two billion, that might be the end of it. For uh -huh. others at two hundred billion, that might be the end. I don't know. It depends on the company, but you have to figure that out. Or something else could go wrong with the company that stops it from being able to continue to have that that flywheel. You know, that's working for it. Um, 
Yeah, it's like something being viral. You know, if it if that's going to continue to happen, then you're going to make money in it. Um, but if you probably the multiple that you're paying is too high, so that if it stops, where you end up is not going to be that good. Um, these aren't crazy though that I can see. The last one I think you know, um, turns out I think I was probably wrong because they were showing EV below market cap, which doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but Danaher, yeah. Um, these aren't low valuations though for companies that, I mean, so revenue growth, 6%, EPS, 11%. Um, I mean, like for instance, what's meta at? Oops. Still over FB, you know, uh-huh. um, what's, what's Google. Google at? What's Alphabet at? Yeah. Well, we know what the price is. Yeah. You the, gotta feel so the growth rate is twice as fast and the multiple is two thirds. Um, other ones, I don't know. I couldn't think off the top of my head of ones that have exactly that growth rate. Um, but they're probably ones that are a lot cheaper. Um, well, when we looked at Stella Jones, for instance, what was that at? Yeah, so Stellar Jones earnings per share and, and things like that are a bit better than um, uh, than Danaher. The growth rate. Yeah, and the P is one third mm -hmm. level. So, when we talk about these companies, do you ever get emails sent to you after talking about it on the podcast, uh, going over these businesses? Maybe other people follow them. Sometimes I do. Yeah, uh, it depends. It'll depend on what kind of company. Um, so there's kind of two that it can happen with. One is if we mention a company that's kind of more, mm, so something like Stella Jones or something I, we've mentioned before, but probably what would happen is like in a week or two, I might get emails from people that they took a look at it after hearing about it on the show. If I mention something like Transdime, there'll be people who are own it or short it, whatever, and they might mention something right away. Yeah, I get the tweets. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so... I think the, so it's more of this sort of thing is like someone looking at something that we just mentioned um, will take a little while and then just saying that they looked at it. But it's, and it actually the ones that probably get it more if I mention something but like don't elaborate on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that mentioning a stock and then not really elaborating on it and they look it up. The two stocks that people come after us for if we talk about it, Aircap Holdings and Transdime. Are those the two? Yeah. yeah. But Transime has a pretty large following, I would say. So you had said that. And Transime, I mean, if they get done shares instead of cash, maybe it would be shareholders. Yeah, maybe. Because they acquired, you know, um, Breezy Stern. That's right. Yeah. Um, you had said that you don't typically like those companies. And it's because, like, just the idea of roll-ups. And you had said sometimes it's because you don't understand exactly what they're doing or you have to trust how it's being presented to you is how it's actually right. going on. I, I want to be clear. I don't dislike roll-ups at all. Uh -huh. And it's fine for other people to invest in roll-ups. There's lots of things they don't generally buy, don't generally buy tech at all. Um, that doesn't mean I don't think it's a great business. Software is a... a once you have enough scale, software is a great business. I just can't find a lot of software companies to buy um, because I don't understand them well enough. I don't usually understand well enough to my satisfaction what is going on in the business mm -hmm. uh, and what they're doing. And a major reason for that is because I would have to trust entirely what management is saying. I feel that most of these companies, and it's not just these, but other ones that we could talk about, whatever information we would get from someone talking to us, emailing or whatever, to analyze the company saying well, okay here's how i look at it here are you basically using numbers provided by management yeah it's right from the investor presentation including like what is the returns on things what things do they target whatever which is fine but you have to look and say well is that really true you know like um to what extent not that they're being dishonest about it or whatever but like you have to check it for yourself to get an idea of to what extent are they really investing on that basis? What are they drifting in terms of acquisitions that are different than how they used to do in the past? What really drove these acquisitions in the past? You know, any of those things. So there's just somewhere I feel that I can understand the repeatability of the business. 
I mentioned those books before. The um, uh, what is it? Uh, the, you know, repeatability. There's what growing the core. Uh, there's like three of them, um, and those are pretty good for understanding the kinds of growth that we would be looking for. Uh, if we're ever going to invest in fast growing things, it would usually be things that could we feel we can understand how they're growing into adjacent sort of they're either repeating the exact same model or they're growing into adjacent sort of businesses. Um, and inquiring entirely different businesses and a roll up type thing is often difficult for us to analyze. Uh, it's difficult for me to analyze to my satisfaction. Uh, and that's the only problem with it. Mm -hmm. And that's often the problem with many tech things. I'm not sure that I understand enough about the customer behavior. People can tell me that, you know, this is what the customer behavior is. It's hard for me without knowing a lot about it to come away with the idea about what the durability of it is. And this is the same sort of idea. When you're paying high multiples for it, it is the same idea. Just as you have to do a lot of analysis of the durability of a business, you have to do a lot of analysis of the durability of this acquisition model because usually these are based, the, the case for the investment relies on them continuing to be a serial acquirer. Yeah, sure. Okay. If it didn't, then it would be a lot there. Then you would need to know a lot less. Yeah. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if the multiple is saying it has to continue to be a serial acquirer and be getting above average returns in what it's doing, you know, leveraged or whatever, but above average returns, um, that's, that's a very high bar to, to clear for me in terms of how much information you need. And management teams at these companies are very aware of, like you said, their multiples, their credit ratings, stuff like that. I wonder if that ever presents a different type of pressure to do deals and to find the next deal and to continue to do bigger deals and stuff like that. Yeah, it, it does. Because I mean, not all of them are like Buffett that could sit and a lot right. of cash for two years and the market go do all the craziness that it's been doing and feel completely comfortable doing that. Yeah. But some of them I think are pretty comfortable with not worrying about what their stock price is and stuff. I think that's true for some. Yeah. Um, the stock will do whatever it will do. Um, and they're going to keep doing their acquisitions and they're going to keep trying to explain it. But I think that there's plenty of them where that's the case. And I don't think that it's necessarily that there's more risk of that. I don't think there is more risk of that in like serial acquirers uh, than there is in like unprofitable companies or, I mean, that's more the risk of unprofitable tech companies, SPACs, things like that are much higher risk than serial acquirers. Um, serial acquirers do sometimes run into the same issue, not all of them, but some of them of like giving you ideas of how many they're going to acquire over how long a period of time and whatever. And that can be a little hard because you might not hit those targets and um, you know, then people start like extrapolating that ahead of time. So that's a little bit like the way that the SPACs did kind of telling you where they're going to be a few years out. Um, I am always a little cautious about those kinds of things because I don't know the, the opportunities that they find could be way better or way worse than that. So I don't know how they could tell you what they're going to acquire over the next couple of years or something. Although I stress the importance of the multiple in terms of how big your loss can be and stuff, I do want to say that I actually, if picking something like this, would be pretty pricey insensitive i would care about how long is the runway and how much do i like the person running it if i really believe in the person running it and i really think there's a lot of runway i don't think that the price is necessarily that important whether it's very cheap or very expensive and if those things the opposite is true if there's not much runway and if i don't like the person running it don't believe in them know what they're going to do in the future then even at what seems to be a reasonable price, things could not go well. Because of the whole mechanism of what they're doing, I really think it has to be about how long is the runway and how much do you uh, believe in the person running it. I think that's the most important. The multiple thing is that there comes an end to the runway or an end to the person running it. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, you have an issue with the multiple. If you've been a growth stock, you know, you just, you're going to have that. And uh, so I'm stressing the multiple really from the perspective of the possibility that you could lose a lot of money through a re-rating in the multiple, not even necessarily through a real change in the business. That could be one of the upsetting things is that if it just stops being a serial acquirer really for whatever reason and the business, the underlying business performs really well, you could have a massive adjustment in the multiple. 
you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's a very serious thing to think about. But I don't think that I would, that I would think, okay, I'm going to get in a really low multiple in a serial acquirer. It would have to be the person running it really. Mm -hmm. And that's very hard. I say that though, and I want to be cautious saying that because you know, I mean, how many, when would I say that I very confident in the person running it? Like this is not something that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. So I think to a lot of other investors that they, maybe there's more confidence in a lot more of these serial acquire things in terms of the people running it and what they read in the reports and that they like it and, and whatever. I'm talking about maybe a different bar that way because there's not many cases where I'm betting on the jockey. No. So it's pretty, you know that there's a lot of, Stocks where I say we're not investing in that yeah. because of them. Yeah, people. There's involved. not many where I say we're going to invest in this because of the people involved. Um, there's some stocks where I, uh, well, I won't mention the stock, but it acquires a lot. And uh, I don't think the price is crazy. I think the logic of the acquisition stuff makes sense. I think there's some runway. Won't look at it at any price because of the people involved. So, you know. Um, whereas I can't think of many where I, it's because I like the people involved so much. So obviously I, um, am, I guess distrustful of, uh, people running public companies or not less impressed by their strategies for those things. But there's, there's lots where I think it'll work for a time, but I don't know how long and that, you know, could end badly and everything. Yeah. But, and then to be fair, or I guess I should say to play the other side, there's a company, I won't say which, mm-hmm. that everybody hates the manager and you took the other side of that as well, where you didn't think they've done anything too crazy. Oh, I should. Yeah, I'm not just. Yeah, I don't think I'm pessimistic about people. No, and stuff. I know. I, I think, don't want people to get that impression. No, I, I do think that many. We mentioned the company today. I won't say which. I have way more people about which I don't feel that strongly. There are way more CEOs and stuff in which I don't feel as strongly. Uh, people. It would be true for fund managers. be true for lots of things. They think they're a genius. They think they're an idiot. Uh, I think they're less of an idiot than people think. They're less of a genius than people think. That's more commonly my um, feeling about it. And the situation. A lot of times it's also the situation. So a lot of times people say that this person made a mistake because they did whatever. That kind of blaming on that person, I would say. It may have looked like it made sense at the time. They'll do things differently. That's an issue with a lot of these. I mean, so a lot of these stocks, the explanation for a lot of things when we talk about acquisition activity, let's not talk just about serial acquires, but just in general. I don't attribute a lot of the acquiring to the actual, um, much about the personalities of the people running it and more about the times and the industry they're in and the behavior of others around them and stuff like that. So it's the same thing when we talk about like the... Um, uh, the unprofitable tech things. They're all going to run things that way if they go public in the last few years. That's how you do it. They were backed by venture capital things that I don't even know if that is what they, how they would want to run it or not yeah. how they would run, it, run it. We won't know until a different While time. the music's on, sure. Yeah, they were told that's how you have to do it and so they're going to do it that way. At some other time, we may learn more about their personality when it's more tested and see more of a difference between company A and company B. But... For the most part, we're just seeing the same cultural thing reflected over and over again in a lot of different companies there. Um, what does it tell you when you see companies like Uber now saying free cash flow is the answer? I think they've seen a big change yeah. in the um I mean, if that's not a wake-up call, I don't know what is. I think they see a big change in financial conditions, yeah, which is what the Fed's trying to do. That's what they say. They, you know... They they work through tightening financial conditions. That's how they accomplish what their um, interest rate changes are meant to do. That's why you lower inflation stuff. And um, it wasn't their job to allow all these sorts of businesses to prosper. But it's also not they don't care if they kill all of them. Um, it's just something that happened through loose or tight financial conditions. Sure. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, I think that's probably what they see. Some of the other ones I don't know as much about. Um, there must be other things going on. There's some weird things going on in the economy, obviously. Because you had the warning sort of thing from Snap. 
Yeah. Which obviously means there's something much more stressful going on in terms of certain kinds of advertising that they must be seeing that like the major ad agencies don't see. So it has to be among the Ubers and stuff of mm-hmm. the world that they're all saying no more advertising. You know, so all the unprofitable type tech companies must be like really cutting back on advertising, which is what we saw in the dot com um, crash. A big issue for a lot of companies, like take the Motley Fool, because that's something that a lot of people listening to this podcast will know that website and all that. They almost failed. So why they almost failed? It's not because they like didn't have as many people going to the site. The traffic probably went up at the time they were yeah, about to fail. Sure. But they were ad supported at the time, right? So you're ad supported. Okay, that shouldn't be the end of the world. But almost all their advertising was for other internet based things, especially around stocks, mm-hmm. right? So it is an interesting issue of like what that looks like because I do see a lot of advertising and a lot of other things too. It could be office space. It could be all sorts of other things that we can talk about in in specific areas that have an effect this way. But there's like the second order. uh, That's a big word right there. (laughs) Uh, Ray Dalio, come on. uh, Affects that sort of thing. So um, I mean – Berkshire, uh, I mean, uh, not Berkshire, but um, what am I trying to say? Um, what am I trying to say? Wesco was at the time. Who acquired Court? Do you remember who acquired Court um, Furniture? I don't remember. No. Okay. So Wesco it, Financial. It may have been Wesco. And then, yeah, it probably was Wesco. But um, so owned, you know, by Berkshire, but I don't think Berkshire was the one who did it. But uh, that was a, not a good investment. And it was because furniture rental was a huge thing in the dot-com boom. And then after that, it was not. And you may not think of all the things that are related that way. So uh, a bunch of them must see that. I certainly see that as much as I try to uh, have the most privacy possible in terms of using the internet compared to other people in terms of tracking and stuff. So who knows whether I'm seeing an accurate representation of what people see in terms of advertising. But I am seeing a... um, uh, unrepresentative sample, I think, online of advertising that's being done in certain online things versus what's advertising like in the U.S. generally. So, yes, you see your ads for your Disney World and your Chevy Silverado and your CC's Pizza and stuff, right? Mm-hmm. You get a nice mix of it that way, which is a lot more what a lot of advertising is. But there's way more advertising than I would have expected from unprofitable companies that aren't all tech companies, but they're all companies that were starting in the last decade or so and that spend a lot on advertising to acquire a lot of customers. And so they're more susceptible to that sort of thing, to like, you know, um, what the funding situation is. Even very big companies, you know, like um, food delivery companies and stuff are huge. They advertise a lot, but does that mean you'll see less advertising and does that affect other internet companies because of that, you know, because they're all ad supported. Mm-hmm. So I, some of them may see things that we don't see. They obviously have to be because it's the, if, if advertising, if their advertising situation was representative of advertising generally of what we know, that can explain things like why Snap would be concerned and, and because it's not showing up in the overall advertising situation in the United States. Yeah, Snap has had a few aftermarket earnings calls that have caused like massive moves well, in that stock. I mean, massive that was, swings. That was actually an update a month after an earnings call. So why are you updating? Did it get one? leaked? No, that was, they just, well, it didn't get leaked, but did they choose to do it because they were going to say stuff to their staff? Mm-hmm. You mean? Yeah. Because they were, they knew that it would be leaked when mm-hmm. they said a bunch of things. Yeah. To, so Get let's also it. have it mm-hmm. put something out. Yeah, that's possible. So it was, we know this will be leaked. So let's also put out this official mm-hmm. statement. Yeah, that might be. Um, Still a $20 billion company. This is another one, though. Like, I think, what you know, we talk about... Um, well, it's a very influential sort of... I mean, it's very it important is. app. I mean, just like we're talking about, you I'm know, Uber doesn't make any money and stuff, basically. You know, I shouldn't say that, but it had not made it that money and became very important to society, right? It's another one of those names, though, that's sort of like Twitter, where mm-hmm. they haven't really generated a huge amount of economic profit and it's been great to be an employee. Shares outstanding have diluted a bunch. And the stock price, again, the stock's been all over the place. Um, had, was it ever? Oh, I guess, oh, no, yeah. Kind no, of no, it was. Yeah. I, was I, I thought it was never a very successful stock, but it, that's it not was, true. It suddenly exploded. Yeah. yeah. 
But now we're back to 15 bucks. They IPO uh, probably right around here. Mm -hmm. And they haven't really generated any meaningful earnings. And the shares outstanding have gone from about a billion to 1.5 billion today. This looks very similar to Twitter. Also similar to like what we're looking at with Coinbase. If you look, if that's correct, I don't know how QuickFS does this, but it says here that the trailing 12 months, they spent 1.7 billion on R&D, uh -huh. while revenue was 4.4 billion. Yeah, revenue has gone up a lot. Okay, but to put gross this in profit. perspective, for instance, gross yeah, profit. So normally you think of gross profit has to cover SGNA, R&D, other things like that. Yeah. So Buffett would say that like marketing is a gross profit royalty. I would also say that research and development has to come out of gross profits, really. Now, maybe tech things, they don't think that way, but that's usually how I think of it as being funded. So a percentage of revenue is a meaningful thing. That's usually what people talk about, percentage of revenue. Like, so you spend 10% of your revenue on research and development. But I think it's often useful to look at in terms of gross profit, right? This is astronomical. Yeah. If that's true, that they're spending one point. I mean, the year before, 2021, their their R and D was almost at the same level as um at, uh yeah. Yeah, let's look back. Well, I mean one more year, sorry. 2020, their uh R and D and gross profit were pretty similar as they were the year before, 2019. So basically take all of gross profit and spend an R and D, and then your losses are equal to your SGNA and other operating expenses. So what we're seeing in the operating profit that's negative is basically all of the uh Fixed costs. Mm -hmm. If we think that R and D is not a fixed cost, that they, that they can vary it. Um, so those are just the administrative costs of doing business, all the fixed costs of it. So that's really paid for by losses every year that we can see here. It's not covered at all by anything else because the 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 only thing that gross profit is covering is R and D until this year. Um, everything else is just paid out through a loss. The crazy thing is, is that the business, the actual product itself, hasn't changed like at all since launch. Yeah. There's more advertisers on the platform, <laughs> but I'm saying the actual from like a customer standpoint. Well, that is the fascinating thing. Now you can about, do groups, right. you know, have group chats yeah. and stuff with your buddies, but that's it. That is the fascinating thing about these tech things, right? Like all the value create, a lot of the value created, honestly. So like, where's this R&D going? Right. It doesn't take a lot of R&D to come up with the thing that goes viral. Now you might need a lot of R&D, and I don't know what the classifying is R&D, but you might need a lot of this stuff just given your size later on. But whether you're a successful company or not comes from the early stages of it. I mean, even Google or something, now looking back on it, how much R&D did they spend in those years leading up to them becoming the leading search engine versus how much did they spend after, mm -hmm. you know, Facebook or any of those. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us on the Focus Compounding Podcast. If this is the first time you're joining us, be sure to check out all of our content on the internet. The best place to get everything that we put out is by following me on Twitter, which is at focused compound. I'll have all the information down below. If you're listening to us on uh, either Spotify or iTunes or whatever other podcast app you listen to podcasts on, be sure to hit the subscribe button, leave us a rating and review. It goes a very long way. If you're interested in learning more about our money management services, uh, reach out to me, Andrew at focuscompounding.com. We have a hedge fund and a managed accounts arm uh, where we custody the assets through interactive brokers. Uh, so let's start a conversation. Reach out to me, Andrew at FocusCompound.com. I thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you in the next podcast. Take care.